So good afternoon. I will be presenting preliminary research on a value-added grains for organic production systems project, which is part of a much larger collaboration between Cornell University, the Organic Growers Research and Information Sharing Network, the Pennsylvania State University, North Dakota State University, Green Market New York City, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York, and the Northern Plains Sustainable Agriculture Society. So what can small grains do for organic systems? Um, first, small grains can help to build soil organic matter through fibrous root systems and high carbon plant residues. Second, they can help break disease cycles when used in rotation with higher value crops. Third, winter wheats, rye, and triticale can be very competitive against weeds when used in rotation. And fourth, um, winter grains in particular provide an opportunity for diverse rotations uh, with forage crops and with legumes that can help um, tighten nitrogen cycling in organic systems. So despite these benefits, many organic farmers do not use small grains in their rotations um, because of their relatively low um, economic value in the marketplace, particularly for small farmers. And as 85% of organic farms in the Northeast United States are small farms, um, it's not surprising that a lot of um, profitable farm enterprises do not include small grains. So a goal of our project is to find profitable small grains that organic farmers can use to improve their systems but also turn a profit. And we've decided to focus on our project on heritage and ancient wheats um, as potentially high value products. And specifically, we're evaluating the variety performance of high value small grains um, from very diverse lines. And we um, are focusing on heritage wheats and heritage wheats refer to cultivars uh, that were developed before the use of dwarfing genes in the 1950s. And we're also focusing on emmer, einkorn, and spelt, which are also known as ancient wheats. And so ancient wheats are um, species that are related to wheat, uh, but they have hulls that do not fresh free from the grain. And there's renewed interest in these uh, heritage and ancient wheats due to their unique tastes, um, a general interest in ancient foods in the marketplace, and potential health benefits. Um, but to ensure that these possibly productive varieties, as we're evaluating them in organic systems, uh, will turn a profit in the marketplace, uh, we're looking to test the varieties for milling, baking, and sensory quality according to regional millers, bakers, and consumers of the Northeast United States in particular. And finally, as many of these um, species and varieties are new to growers in the Northeast United States and elsewhere, uh, we're helping to determine uh, the best seeding rates, seeding dates, and um, nitrogen rates for protein in particular uh, for these grains. So our project sites um, form a gradient of moisture and temperature and soil types in the Northeast United States from central Pennsylvania up to near the Canadian border um, in Willsboro, New York. And additionally, we have um, Carrington, North Dakota as our final site where only our spring types were grown. So the next few figures are going to show some preliminary results from our first two years of variety trials in winter wheat. Uh, we have the same data available for spring wheat, spelt, and emmer, and einkorn, um, but due to time, I will not be presenting all of those today. Um, and in 2015, once we have four years of data, we will make um, these data available to farmers so that they can select the varieties best performing in their region and for their particular needs in their agricultural system. So here we can see the, the difference in yield by year and site, and then the average over all of those years and sites. 
And it is interesting to note, um, red fife is a winter, is a spring wheat variety uh, that is a heritage and it has a lot of interest, particularly in the Northeast. Um, and some farmers were able to grow this spring wheat as a winter variety, which was very exciting. Um, it provided a lot more flexibility in the growing season. Uh, but red fife, while it did survive the winter and produce at our, our southern sites in southern New York and Pennsylvania. It did not survive the winter in Willsboro. So um, when used as a winter, it is susceptible to colder climates. So test weight is a measure of the density of the grain, the weight of a given volume of grain, and it can be important for um, milling quality of the grain. And we're seeing a few varieties that hold promise of high test weight, so high milling quality, and also high yield, um, such as ARS-173 and Warthog. And our winter wheats, uh, their test weight was inversely correlated with the total precipitation from March to July. Um, and Woolsboro really showed the most extreme values in that case um, from their 2012 dry season and very high test weight to a very wet uh, spring season and very low test weight in 2013. So height is a characteristic of interest to organic farmers as they uh, many farmers like to uh, cut their crop for grain but then also use the stock um, for bedding. And so a lot of our older heritage varieties um, that you'll see on the, the higher portion of this graph um, do have a lot of straw. So they produce a lot of biomass, even though they might not have the highest grain yield. Um, so this is of, of interest to growers. So we can't rely on yield and test weight alone to select for varieties because um, small organic farmers and many organic farmers in the Northeast um, conditions in particular cannot compete in the, um, the, the conventional wheat uh, marketplace. And as a result, we need to follow through to see how these wheats um, add value through a regional um, processing system. So we decided to do this by first taking 37 varieties of spring and winter wheats and analyzing them for protein, falling number, um, and DON, which is a measure of vomitoxin in the grain, uh, which is a concern for human consumption. And it's a particular concern in our case as consumers in the Northeast prefer whole wheat breads, and most of the toxin is located in the bran. So next, um, Millers from the region will gather to assess the different varieties for milling quality. And then last month, um, we took a subset of varieties and a panel of regional artisanal bakers um, spent a weekend evaluating um, the process of making breads from variety-specific um, breads and flours according to the standards of the region, which are whole wheat stone ground flour and sourdough um, baking procedures without any added yeast. And then finally, uh, last month, a panel gathered to evaluate the sensory attributes of those breads baked from distinct varieties and of also the taste of the whole grains that were cooked from those varieties. So how we selected those seven varieties for the quality analysis, um, we wanted an equal representation of spring and winter types. And then we wanted a group that were traditionally grown in the region and familiar to growers, and then heritage varieties of interest, and then new varieties that had performed well in our trials. And so here are baking trial results. And so the graph left to right is showing the baking process. And it's interesting that at the beginning of the mixing, farmers' preferred varieties um, were, let's see, Tom and Fullcaster. 
And that changed uh, during the middle portion of the proofing and the makeup of the bread. And Glen uh, was the preferred variety at that point in time. And then near the end, um, the final crust characteristics were preferred uh, among Tom and Glen. So we're beginning to see a picture of uh, performance from the field to the mill to the bakery. And this picture will be complete once we have the results from the sensory analysis to see what consumers will think of these particular varieties. Um, and coming out of this, three varieties in particular have shown promise of high yield, high test weight, and good baking quality. And these are Glenn, Tom, and Warthog. And it's um, good to note that Warthog um, baked very well for a low protein of 10.2%. Um, and these proteins, uh, we will add a caveat, they are definitely biased. We only used one site um, for our, to make our flour and analyze it um, for the baking analysis. So we haven't seen 10.2 be a representative number for um, the region. So next we're evaluating uh, seeding date and seeding rate of these ancient grains in particular. So emmer um, has a potential of being a, um, a rescue crop when soils are wet and soils are frozen and farmers can't get in their field early enough. And so we uh, went off kind of um, that, that notion that individuals had talked about to see if that was indeed the case. And at one site in one year, we evaluated einkorn, emmer, and wheat planted at an optimal planting date, and then um, several points after that to see how uh, resilient they would be to late planting. And indeed, you can see emmer here on the green line. Um, it was much more resilient to later planting dates than, um, than wheat, which is promising. Uh, it's also important to note that the yields here for emmer and einkorn are calculated in the hull, and the, um, the weight of the grain from that total weight of grain and hull is generally between 55 to 80 percent. Finally, at four different sites, um, we used five different seeding rates of emmer to see what is the optimal planting density for emmer. And we did not see any significant differences among these five different seeding rates. Um, some sites did see an, a little bump in yield from the lowest seeding rate to the second seeding rate at 84 um, kilograms per hectare, um, but that wasn't consistent among all sites. Uh, this result is promising um, for a lot of farmers as MR seed is very expensive and this can help save on cost and improve returns. So, um, I want to thank everybody from the project and our funding coming from the OREI grant of NEFA. Thank you.